Thank you very much for setting that up. So I'm actually going to talk to something about your but to my heart. And I, this is a bit facetious, but I think it really is um, something that I think we should be aware of. And we're talking about, you know, public health policy in the nutrition space. And I thought, well, one of the big controversies, what's healthy food? I mean, you know, we've heard lots of presentations. I mean, that's what we strive for. But it's not as simple. I think this is when you're talking about the policy space is where you really get the science and the policy and the politics all start coalescing when governments and other advisory bodies are trying to set recommendations. And we want to keep the science separate. But unfortunately, when you translate the science into what might be recommendations or policy, many other factors start getting in. I won't say in the way, but get involved is probably the way to say it. So anyways, that's what I'm going to speak to you about today. And I mean, I don't think any of you, at least anyone that ever comes to my lab needs to, um, hasn't seen a slide similar like this. But if you're talking about the risk factors for chronic disease, um, diet is right up there at the top. And I think tobacco is probably the leading cause of most chronic diseases, but Canada's got a fairly low smoking rate, particularly among women. So other than that, high blood pressure is the biggest one, which is sodium related, but dietary risks are really the main um, risk factors for chronic disease if it isn't tobacco. So when you talk about uh, chronic diseases, I mean, the world has changed. And I was part of a work with the World Health Organization many years ago, early in the 2000s, when I was still at Health Canada. And it was really helping them shift where the World Health had focused most of its efforts in what we'd call the, um, you know, communicable diseases, you know, clean water, communicable diseases, where they were. But people, even in the developing world, were dying of chronic diseases. And that was a huge shift to start thinking about what can we do to prevent chronic disease? Because, um, you know, if we're here in Canada, we're lucky enough to have healthcare systems, to have pharmaceutical interventions if they care for chronic disease. But I did an evaluation for um, the Caribbean for CARICOM at one time in the 90s. They had one dialysis machine in uh, Jamaica at the time. You would not believe the rates of diabetes they had and complications. So you can just sort of see that in the developing world, you lose your most productive citizens if you're not looking at chronic disease prevention. And that was a real big shift early in the 2000s at World Health to start saying, and, and that filtered into governments, not just looking at the problems with um, in communicable diseases, but in chronic diseases. And around the world, about 70% of the early mortality is due to chronic diseases. And in Canada, it's about 88% because we've obviously solved many of the other um, um, communicable diseases. And right now, um, some data out of fact, it's several years old, but three out of five have at least one communicable disease in this country. And many people have comorbidities and multiple ones. And we saw how not only do those diseases kill people, but we saw, for example, the COVID pandemic, where those chronic diseases also put you in elevated risk for things like a pandemic. So really, but we're lucky, well, we're sort of lucky in the sense that chronic disease should be, is a modifiable risk factor, whether we can do it or not, is where policy comes along. And I think what we're really, and where I've been working at is really to sort of shift, even when we talk about policy, is really start shifting that responsibility. And if you're talking about it, I mean, really originally a lot of the work and a lot of the guidance, the documents were really putting the responsibility and the onus on the individual. I mean, you know, if you're overweight, if you're chronic disease, it's something because you, you, did, you ate poorly, you made poor choices, and it's your fault. And it was almost an res individual's responsibility. And if you look at it from a policy and a food systems, it's saying it's really the environment. And if we don't have the policies and the regulations and the supports for healthy eating, no wonder people can't do well. So really move from what the original policies in the nutrition space were really educational orientated, like food guides, food labeling, to what we call regulatory processes. And the first regulatory processes were really mandating that information. So the consumers still had the responsibility, but at least for now we were making sure they had that information. That's still a big jump to make, to be all the consumers to actually use that information. And then I'd say the most recent interventions in the food policy space is saying, how do we make these healthier food environments through policies and regulations? And I think the most recent examples are those of trans fats, reductions that eventually they're banned in, in processed foods, sodium reduction targets, which I'll tell you have been totally miraculously unsuccessful because they've been voluntary, but things like restricting marketing to food for kids. And one of the things that Canada's joining a number of countries in the world is mandatory front-to-pack labeling. I'm gonna use that as an example 
of how I think we can start creating these food environments and do it through multiple ways. And if you're talking about you want to have healthier food environments, and some of you have seen some of these slides, but I mean, you want to know what's a healthy food, you're telling people to eat healthy, and that's always the big challenge. And I know one of my students said a thing, well, maybe that be baked beans, Harvey, to you, wasn't a very healthy recipe, you know, it probably was the high sodium one and with, you know, a, a pork-based, um, you know, lard type uh, meat in it, but anyways. But you face with this whole set of foods, how do you say which one is the healthier, at least healthy one? And that's where um, my lab does a lot of work on, we've done a lot of work, I've done a lot of work with the World Health is these nutrient profiling systems. Like you actually need some criteria and those in inputs are usually the nutrient levels in the foods or various food components, things like whole grains where it's not specifically a nutrient, those are your inputs. And then you usually have some kind of algorithms or some kind of rules and then you have an output. And then that is either a binary decision, yes, no, it's a healthier and unhealthy food, it meets a pro criteria or standard, or it doesn't. In other words, could it be marketed to kids or not? Or you might have a score, one to five, one to 10, one star, five stars, as you can see, and then you might get your foods rated from the healthiest to the uh, to the healthiest to least healthiest or whichever way. So that nutrient profiling is really important because you make a policy-based decision, but you need some transparent method in order to base your policy on. And these nutrient profiling systems are really what you use to make these policy-based decisions or policies or regulations that go around them. And WHO defines it as these classifying or ranking foods, but for preventing disease and promoting health, because I mean, we could have a system for environmental impact. There's lots of other profiling systems, but these are specifically related to protecting health and preventing chronic disease. Okay, so we know what nutrient profiling is, and we're gonna to say to Canadians, choose a healthy food, and that's what things like the food guide does. We're actually faced with the food supply that is high in sugar, sodium, saturated fats. And this is actually a slide I got from Health Canada because I liked it, but it really nicely shows that, you know, two thirds of our packaged foods are high in sugars, three quarters are high in sodium, a third have, you know, more fat than we need. So you can see that if you're faced with making healthy food choices, you don't always have a lot to work with. And even when you did, how do you actually identify those foods? <laughs> and so there's a, oh, this came up backwards, but anyways, there's a whole slew of policies out there that can help consumers, right from the food guide to um, things like um, nutritional labeling. But I really wanna focus as the example today on front of pack labeling. And I think, this is a new policy. The regulations were passed in July of 2022. I worked really hard behind the scenes and with a lot of NGOs to really help get those regulations through. And I think it's a set of regulations that are dear to my heart and we hope that have good um, outcomes and I'll explain some of the data later. But with the front of pack regulations, any food that exceeds thresholds for either their sugar, sodium or sat fat levels will have a warning symbol or high end symbol such as the one shown here. So, okay, so this is the policy I'm gonna talk about. So I said it's the science, the policy and the um, politics. So I'm gonna walk us through with that lens on front of pack labeling. So what's the science say? Well, if you, just like any consumer, you go into a store, this is like what like you're faced with, making it selection amongst a, a grocery aisle that looks something like this. We make an average of a couple, eight seconds, five to eight seconds when people, most people make their food choice. So you can imagine um, that might be a bit difficult to make the healthier choice in that environment. So actually how does front of pack labeling work? It works through a couple of ways. One, it can actually promote product reformulation. So the consumer doesn't even really have to worry about it. So what happens is the because the companies would have to put some kind of symbol or a warning label on the front of their food, it actually promotes the food manufacturers to reformulate the foods to get, whether it's the most stars. In New Zealand, they showed that 83% of the foods actually did underwent some kind of reformulation to get more stars. You know, you're actually seeing the benefit. And in Chile, where they actually used a, a, like the stop sign warning label, they actually found that once they announced the policy between the time they announced it in 2014 and the time that it actually came in force in 2017, the proportion of products that would have required a warning label went down from 51% of their food supply to 44%. So right there, they used that time before the regulations to start reformulating foods so they wouldn't have to carry a warning label. So that's 
one thing so the consumer doesn't even have to do anything. The food industry is already adapting to that system so that they have their foods in the most favorable light. But then the second thing will actually change consumer behaviors. And so there's lots of evidence out there that shows that these front of pack systems can actually help consumers you know, easily and more quickly actually identify and determine which foods are the healthy fullness. Whichever system is used, they can more easily find those foods. And then not only can they see them and select them, they actually say that they select or they actually have evidence that they do consume less of those foods with the high end warnings or more foods with more stars. And so they, they really do choose less of these less healthy foods. And I'm just going to give you some of the data. So um, this is Australia and New Zealand's data. They actually have a health star rating. And I got the little symbol up there. And it's number of stars. So foods can have anywhere from half star increments up to five stars. So in other words, a 10 point scale. And when they found, they found the data and they followed the data from 2014 on up to about uh, 2019. And they actually saw that the number of foods that are showing that displaying stars, and this is a voluntary system, but more and more manufacturers have chosen to actually show stars in their foods. That's great. Good success. And they actually predicted if it kept up at that rate where it would be. Well, on the spring, I asked, asked somebody um, from um, Australia at the time, and they said, well, it actually stalled. Uh, you know, I think the ones that were good got their stars on and it's kind of nobody else is doing much. And sure enough, if you look at the next slide, um, this is actually showing the uptake. So who's putting the stars on? It's the healthy foods. And you can see that there's only about 16% of the low starred foods putting the front of pack labels on, while over 50% of the foods that have, you know, three, four, five stars are choosing to. So is it really helping the consumer if you're faced with half of the food supply without stars and the chances are they're the less healthy ones or the food manufacturers have chosen not to. So that's part of the problem with voluntary systems is tend to be the ones that where their food would be shown in the most favorable light are most likely the ones to to use the type of system. But if we compare that to the story in Chile, now Chile is the first country in the world that actually went to mandatory front of pack labels and they chose a warning label and I'll show you some of the evidence later on of why they chose that system. But this is the, the first one is um, breakfast cereals. And those are data, early data that came out that said before the implementation, these were the number of foods that would um, have to have a warning label for uh, sugars. And then the other side, of oh, first, the first column is for calories and the second column is for sugars. My screen isn't big enough. My eyes are too old, but anyways, we'll get there before the evening is out. And you can see that over the course of those couple of years, that the from 2015 16 to 2017 the number of foods that were breakfast cereals that would either be high in calories or high in sugar actually went down and, and went down significantly and you can see on the next where the bar black bar graphs are the bottom are just the distribution so you can see the shape of the curve so more foods had lower more there are more foods with fewer cal more breakfast there's the fewer calories of all the options and more with fewer uh, sugar in them. And you can see that that happened for sugars in um, soda, beverages, sugars in other beverages, sugars in the uh, breakfast cereals, but also lower sodium options for cheeses and for meats. So those, those front of pack labeling really did stimulate um, this reformulation of food supply to get so that manufacturers could get their levels below the thresholds where they would have to put the warnings on. The other interesting thing we've heard about regulations about proposed for sugar sweetened beverage taxes. Um, this is some data that came out with Chile. Now, so this sugar sweetened beverage taxes are likely only to work if they're high enough to actually impact purchase decisions. In this case, they used a low, effectively a 3% tax, which had very little impact on these um, consumption, the per sorry, purchase of sugar sweetened beverages. So they compared that, so they got a 3.5% uh, per capita consumption increase in consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages with a sugar-sweetened beverage tax. But if you compare that to what they get with the warning labels on the sugar-sweetened beverages, they actually got a 23, almost a 24% reduction in sales of sugar-sweetened beverages in Chile. So they don't have consumption in Chile, but they've been monitoring sales data. So obviously that's a pretty good proxy of what people are consuming if the sales are going down. And so the second set of four slides are actually the sales data of the foods for the different nutrients. So, and I'll explain it. It's a bit complicated, but if you look at the calorie in the corner, 
you can see that the um, one of the bar in the middle is how many how what the sales went down in of the calories. They have warnings for calories as well, so it's gone down quite dramatically. There are a lot fewer sales of foods that had a calorie warning or sugars or something. That's the middle bar. If you go to the far right side, obviously the sales are not, people didn't stop buying uh, soft drinks, for example, or other foods. They act those foods, they actually substituted, still bought some of those foods. And though some of those foods still had calories or sugars or sodium, but they were lower level. So the far right hand, say far left hand side and backwards, the darkest red bar, the darkest purple bar said that the net reduction is still down. They still reduce their overall intakes of calories, sugars, sat fats, and sodium, but obviously not as much as the sales went down for the high sodium foods or high sugar foods because people still bought some of those foods. They just bought the lower um, options now. So I think you're still seeing, even though, so I think you have to be careful. You just measure the sales of the high sugar ones. They will absolutely go down, but people will still replace it with the lower options. But that net, you still have the net gain of reductions in those nutrient levels of purchases. Peru is another example, just to throw it in, same thing. This was um, data. Um, they, first of all, they, um, they um, surveyed consumers and over 90% said that yes, the front of pack label would influence a purchase decision. In other words, they would choose either fewer foods with front of pack so they just wouldn't buy them at all or buy less with the ones with front of pack. And they actually saw 11% decrease in the sales of products with front of pack labels, which are the red bars on the side. And the biggest impacts that were, were in carbonated beverages um, and cookies and some of the other products. I mean, those are pretty obvious ones. I think they're very discretionary foods. And those products, people really did buy less of them when they saw the front of pack labels on some of the products. This is a meta-analysis, um, and I just thought of, because there was a lot of controversy in Canada and many other countries, what system do we use? And there's a number of things. So Latin American countries have used the warning labels, and we see those stop signs. Um, Australia and New Zealand have used the STAR system, so it's more positive, like encouraging people to get healthier ones. The UK is that third system, which are effectively a traffic light, so you can see foods are rated, and the second one is the French um, system. And that one's still based ABCD, but it's basically color coded with the reds being the least healthy and the greens the most healthy. And then the facts up front or whatever is just a no interpretation, just giving the amounts. And of course, of the evidence, it says that the um, the warning labels are, were had the most impact, the significant impact on the um, purchases. And I put hypothetical because I think these are all. Um, what do we call like simulated studies, like either simulated grocery stores or doing online or picking foods on a shelf. So it's not really the overall diet, but it really showed that the warning labels were the most um, uh, um, effective at reducing intakes of unhealthy foods. Um, and I think you can look at the traffic light label and it looks like it's not doing too bad. Uh, it's not quite significant, but it's, you know, getting close to when the subsequent data has come out from the UK, what the people in the UK does, about 80, 70% of the decisions in the UK, when they have all that information from red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green, what the evidence is saying is people are actually counting reds. That's the way they used and interpreted the red. Um, it was just easier just to count because how do you make those judgments? And I have some data about that later. And you can see just giving, moving the nutrition facts table, summarizing and sticking up in front without any interpretation was really effectively useless for improving food purchase decisions. So that's some of the evidence leading to the policy. So what, where do the policies go? I mean, I think virtually all these major organizations, excuse me just a second, I'm taking this off and then talk, um, are making recommendations that front of pack labeling is actually a simple, and it's really, there's a couple of things inherent in front of pack labeling. It has to be simple and it has to be interpretive and intuitive. So what do those mean, words mean? It has to be simple. In other words, you don't have to have a big education program around it in order to be it to be useful. So, so simple to use. Interpretive means when I had that other one, I just showed that putting the front up there, those numbers up there, most consumers don't know whether a certain number of sugar is that high or low, is that 
Uh, is that good for you or bad for you? So having something that keys in a yes, no, or a, a suggestion to, so that people can make those judgments, that's interpretive labeling. And that's what front of path label is. And so there's a variety of recommendations and systems and authoritative bodies who have now recommended as a really effective intervention, policy intervention, front of path labeling to change both consumer behavior as well as um, uh, manufacturers' um, reformulations of foods. So if you're going to have effective front of pack regulations, there's a couple of guiding principles to keep in mind. And I think, you know, you can, as I mentioned earlier, that data from Chile, what we know now is they actually had a very ineffective tax, but they didn't design it very well. So, you know, you can have a great policy, but if you don't design it well, it's not going to be effective. So if you're going to have front of pack labeling, you might as well design it well if you're going to have interventions. So a couple of principles are which nutrients do you collect? And I'm going to give you a little bit of example. How do you, your reference, like how do you standardize it? How do you actually design the, the system? Because obviously if it's going to be interpretive and usable by your population, you have to have good design. And I think the principle of consistency. So it has to be consistent with your messaging that a government has already set up in their country for their healthy eating messages. So I'm going to go through each of those areas. So for nutrient selection, I mean, there's two ways you can look at it. If you're going for a positive or negative based system, if you're going to focus on nutrients of concern, which are usually like the warning type labels or the red, yellow, green, is you would then have, these are the nutrients in, in most countries, these are the nutrients of concern. In other words, they're the ones where we, as a rule, most populations succeed, uh, recommend the thresholds for either saturated fats, sodium, free or added sugars. Um, nutrients to encourage. In many countries, it is quite a concern that they have inadequate intakes, whether it's protein, fiber, unsaturated fats, or some of the micronutrients. So some of those considerations, and I'll show actually Canada built in calcium into the front of pack labeling thresholds. So to, um, um, you know, recognizing that calcium is one of the nutrients that we have shortfall nutrients in this country. So you can build your system around what are the nutrients of concern in your country. If you want to have it effective in your country, it has to reflect the nutritional um, status of your country. So you also then if you pick a nutrient, you can pick a single nutrient. So you can just do one nutrient at a time like sodium. Uh, Israel has done the same idea, but they've decided to use with the different languages and, and some issues with literacy that their testing showed that uh, pictographs were much more effective than just the lettering and wording. And several countries are going that route. And people are very familiar with things. I mean, this is a whole grain stamp, but you know, look at one nutrient at a time. It's very easy to comprehend. It's not too complicated. But then you get a multiple nutrients. When you go to multiple nutrients, most of the recommendations say you can't overwhelm the consumer. If you end up with too many nutrients on it, you can't really make judgment decisions. And so, the, the and that's a very small picture, but this slide is from the French system that uses this graded A, B, C, D, E. The consumer, it's based on these nutrients um, to recommend and nutrients to limit. So the green nutrients and the red nutrients, and they're put in, as I said, nutrient profiling into an algorithm to make a decision. So then that final food has a score from A, B, C, D, or E, color coded from green to red. But the consumer isn't faced with a nutrition facts table with all these colors going red, yellow, green, having to make their own decision. And so I think that's where the, um, you know, you can use multiple nutrients, but a consumer really couldn't process all of those nutrients to make a decision when some were mixed up, some were, you know, doing well and others are doing poorly. And then you really, the evidence shows that that all, all those blue like that is pretty ineffectual. Consumers really can't make much use of that type of information. It's just there, one more set of numbers, but they don't really doesn't give them a lot of uh, information to interpret. And, you know, one's more than the other, but is that a good nutrient or nutrient you want to limit? So um, there's no telling them how to interpret that and just the all blue symbols. And I just put this data, this is Canadian data, but, you know, why nutrients that concern the three that were chosen for Canada um, are all, we all exceed them all. Well, three, whether you do total sugars or free sugars, Canada, it, it intakes all of this exceed the recommended thresholds in Canada. So there is justification for the nutrients that were chosen in Canada. So they're, you know, saturated fats, sodium, and total sugars. They use total sugars because we unfortunately don't have free sugars on their nutritional labels. You know, from a policy point of view, we worked hard for them to label um, free sugars, but they didn't listen to us, you know, what can I say? Um, so we're stuck with total sugars, but they've, you know, worked 
ways, workarounds by um, doing some exemptions, say, for example, the naturally occurring sugars, those foods are exempted from having to put a front of pack label. And I'll use like unsweetened milk as an example. So second question, reference values. So, and I use this because this is important. If you looked at this bottle of ketchup versus the, um, you know, these little chicken nugget things, I mean, if you express it per, um, you know, 100 grams, which you'd see, it looked like the, the ketchup bottle has got tons more sodium than the those chicken nugget things. But in actual fact, we eat a lot more, they say 100 grams for a nut challenge that most people would eat more than 100 grams of chicken nuggets. That would just might be an appetizer, not a, a bites, not a, a meal. But that it would have 440 milligrams just in a 100 gram serving. Well, typically a ketchup serving is 15 mils, so 140 milligrams. So that reference really should make sense to your labeling system in the country and what helps the consumers the most. So really, the bigger problem here isn't the ketchup. The bigger problem are the chicken nuggets. So to have the reference amount, in other words, what do you base your front of pack warning on? It's more effective to have that front of pack warning for the sodium on those chicken nuggets than it would be on the bottle of ketchup. So that's the sort of decisions that you have to make when you put de develop, develop your system. And of course, in Canada, we do use serving size, but that's consistent with our nutrition facts table. So it's um, it's consistent and Health Canada has a regulatory system of regulated reference amounts for foods. And you've heard my students talk about that, so we categorize our foods, but they've been standardized. So we know what a reference amount of food for a certain type of food is. And so the, the thresholds be based on the amount relative to that uh, typical standard serving size. So a manufacturer can't say, oh, like I question that chicken nugget piece that they said. So there's advertising it as an appetizer, but in actual fact, it may be eaten as a meal. But those standard reference amounts are amounts that we would typically, so manufacturer couldn't make an artificially low serving size to avoid having to put their front of warning, front of pat warning on it. Design. So I've got two sets of studies. The one on the left, uh, my left, your left too, is um, data from the UK. And they just asked people, if you saw those you know, sets of four dots, which would be the healthier food? And I challenge which one of you, each one of you to say is the one with uh, one red, one green, and two yellows healthier than two reds and two and two yellows. You know, people cannot make those decisions. So what they end up doing is usually counting the reds. Um, and whether so that's the problem with that type of system. It works great if it was all simple, really clear, but doesn't do very well for those intermediate ones. So that's part of the design. Is it going to work? Will it be useful? And then the group on the right-hand side were done by Chile when they were designing theirs and just look at it and say, which one do you think would be the easiest to recognize that the first one you'll see? And I challenge any people that that second, number six is probably the one that you would notice first. Um, some of those hands just get blurred and a lot of the other things. So um, they tested these to see which ones consumers noticed how fast they could find it and see them. And that's the one that they came up with, which is the most effective for catching people's attention for seeing it being able to identify it and so that's what they went with with their system in and to understand that it meant a cautionary um, you know those are the foods that you want to limit your intakes of and that's one of the principles of design in um, front of pack warning but I would say if you're designing anything it should be quick and easy and this is a, a book and it's, a, it's actually um, an economist to economists but they actually developed the theory of thinking fast and slow and, and different decisions require you to make fast or slow um, decision making. And I would say if you're buying a house or you're buying a car, you don't you spend more time on, that's a big decision. And that would be a slow decision making. You know, many things go into that decision. But a typical shopping trip is actually a fast decision making. You want to expand, minimize both the effort and the amount of time you spend in making that decision. And if you don't want to spend a lot of time and effort on it and recognizing that's the decision making that goes on in grocery shopping, you need a simple system that minimizes the time and effort to make that purchasing decision and make a healthy food purchasing decision. So I think some of these theories are really applicable to how you design your front of pack system to make it quick and easy because recognizing that's the type of decision making that goes on in food purchasing. So here's some examples of design. And these are actually studies that Health Canada conducted. And the issues they looked at is size, placement, and proximity to other information. So if you look at, you know, the uh, yogurt container, you know, 
having it up in the top right corner versus on the bottom, the one that was noticed the most easiest to identify and find, top right corner. The other thing is the size. And you can see those caramel chips or caramel corns. I mean, absolutely a larger one stood out. That was the one the consumer saw. And so their, their outcome measure was time to identify the front of pack labels. So the re regulations require it to be put in that top quadrant of the product. And then they understood it faster when there's no other symbols nearby. So then you see that soup can, where if you have those two symbols right side by side to find it, there's just too much clutter around it. So the regulations now also require that that can be the only type of claim and symbols in that top quadrant to minimize the that sort of clutter of other proximity to other food symbols and information. So those design elements then are written into the regulations, because if you don't, then obviously food manufacturers would go as much as they could to promote all the other healthier actions for, to probably downplay those front of pack systems if they could. And I think the last principle I said is consistency. And I think if we look at some of our recent policies now, we with the front of pack labeling, it's very consistent. So we have our food guide that guideline two very specifically says, you know, um, a, a guidance about processed and prepared foods and beverages that contribute to excess sodium free sugars and saturated fats undermine healthy eating. Well, we've got that guideline. How are people going to identify those foods that undermine healthy eating through the front of pack labeling? If the front of pack labeling, we might have had said, we might have saw in that guideline to use the front of pack labels to choose foods, but it wasn't there at the time. And that's also consistent with the, um, the front of pack, uh, excuse me, the nutrition facts table, the last set of uh, regulatory changes where they've now added that five is a little and 15% and is a lot. They just happen to use that 15% threshold is the one that they're using now for the food. So it, if they exceed that 15%, those are the foods that would have to have the front of pack symbol on it. So you can see we've now developed this consistency of policy. So we're not having one policy giving mixed messages to the consumer where the food guide might say something else, but it's not consistent with our front of pack labeling system uh, or the actual nutrition facts table, which is on the back of the food guide. And that's really consistent. That's really important that governments, when they write these legislation, ensure that it's these policies and then the legislation coming out of it is consistent for the consumer because we're trying to do fast, simple, and easy. So you don't want to, you want to minimize points of confusion. Um, so these are some studies that were also con conducted um, from Health Canada, but they actually did um, serial choices, you know, giving some people some choices. On the, um, the left-hand side, they picked the healthiest, when they saw, notice the front of pack, they picked the healthiest choice, the one with the, you know, no extra sugar and all that. While when they didn't see the front of pack, the first one they picked were those sugary flakes and you can see the others in granolas and that. So what happened is what might have been their first choice no longer was their first choice when they actually noticed the front of pack symbol. So you actually have to have it noticed for it to be effective. And that's why these design elements are so important because if it's no, not noticed, it's really ineffective. And the other thing I said it has to be quick and easy. So they actually timed how long did it take people to recognize and see the actual um, front of pack system. And this was actually done in a kind of a make-believe grocery store call it that, a, a mock-up grocery store. And if the, the nutrition facts table is then, so just to make a healthy food decision based on just using nutrition facts table, if they even chose to, took about 15 seconds to make that decision. And you can see any of those front of pack systems, there's slight differences, but all they all work to making that decision-making much more simpler and quicker. How long did it take to make those healthy food decisions? So they all worked I mean, that Canada chose that magnifying glass, but they all worked to really make that decision making quick. So I'm talking about front of pack labeling. These are the countries that have mandatory front of pack labeling. You can see this map is just growing massively. And if I had this map up from a couple of years ago, there wouldn't have been half the countries up there. So this is a phenomenon in terms of labeling that's really happening around the world. This evidence is really strong. And so those are mandatory systems. Those are the ones that are recommended by the World Health and most authoritative bodies. A number of countries are still going with what I call voluntary systems. They're probably using what I call government endorsed voluntary systems. The earlier systems were industry driven voluntary systems. So they tended to focus on the attitudes that were most favorable to industry. But you still have, you can see the wide, wide range 
to things that are both, you know, what I would call positive based, like the keyhole it has to be healthy to get that green keyhole, the check mark type systems, to ones that are using the graded ABCD or um, the star systems, which tend to, industry tends to choose to put those on foods when they're voluntary only on the more healthy foods. Now, Europe is faced with an interesting dilemma, and they haven't updated this yet, but they have now, they are trying to harmonize as much of their regulations across Europe, but this is the systems that they have, and they've announced that they would have had this sorted out by 2022. Well, it's almost the end of 2023, and they haven't, but um, you can see now, because they're supposed to be a common trading market across Europe, this right now, these are the types of systems that countries in Europe are all faced with. Um, the Italians, that's the blue one, sorry, Ellen, the Italians have been the most vocal um, advocates against any kind of front of pack labeling. Um, I was involved with the sugar things. It was led by a very big um, confectionery maker in Italy. Um, but they have been adamant against any form of front of pack labeling. It devalues some of their high chocolate things, but also some of their um, deli hams and that, and the Italians have been added in it. But you can see we're still faced with all these things. So I think this has moved into a political decision, which system they go with. I mean, that's probably why they can't come up to a decision, but we shall wait and see where the Europeans come. But you can see what happens when you're trying to have food. How is a consumer going to navigate one system over the other and make some decisions? Um, so, um, but they have announced their plans to do a mandatory and harmonized system, but what system they end up with is still to be determined. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Canada. I'm going to just put them all here. Really, Canada has started this road to, from a policy point of view, right from 2016. Mandatory front of pack labeling was announced in the Healthy Eating Strategy in 2016. Um, they, through 2017 and 18, they went through a lot of consultations. Um, by 2018, they published a Canada Gazette Part 1. That's actually amazingly fast to have it come out, announced in a ministerial letter, and be, have the draft regulations out in 2018. Um, there was a long delay between the final regulations being published in 2022. We were holding our breath that it might crash and burn, but it managed to get through. And I'll show you at the end some of the politicking that went on in between. But then we did have for fuller, further supports coming through the food guide. And this pizza picture is sort of a mock-up of what a package would look like with front-of-pack labeling. So the regulations were finalized in 2022. They will become mandatory in January of 2026. So the food industry had four years, uh, four years to um, be ready for front-of-pack labeling. And so this is what it will be. It's part of the healthy eating strategy. As I mentioned, the dates and the three nutrients of concern that will be the focus will be sat fats, sugars, and sodium. And all foods that exceed the thresholds will have to have the front of pack symbol on the front of the package. And it'll obviously have one, two, or three of the high end symbols on the, uh, in as part of the symbol. And just to kind of, I talk about doing um, nutrient um, profiling. This is sort of how we would do a food system classification. So you'd look at all the foods and then we'd say, there are certain foods in the regulations are excluded. So they won't be on infant formulas. They won't be on meal replacements. Those things like boost and that. They have very specific nutrient requirements. So their alcoholic beverages right now aren't subject to any kinds of nutrition labeling. So those are already excluded. So we won't see front of pack labels on those. And then there's a whole group of exempted foods. And so there's three sets of exemptions, and I don't always agree with all of them, but there's some health-related exemptions, and they've said the foods that have been shown to have protective uh, effects on health. So they say milk, cheese, high in soda, calcium. Great, calcium's a nutrient of concern, but just this past summer, they had a consultation, and they lowered it from being high in calcium to just being a source, like barely 5% of calcium. So they've almost watered it down in the sense of, by you know, the pressure from the dairy industry of really wanting to raise, like to lower the threshold to, to give the exemption to cheeses so that it, even those cheeses that are you know, one of the highest sources of sat fats and, and sodium in the diet, many of them will be exempted now if they lower the, We don't know if they make the decision or not, but they went out to consultation to lower the threshold for the amount of calcium those products would have to have. So we'll see how that works out. There's some technical exemptions um, like raw single ingredient meats, but there are others like small packages. Well, I think why not have, you can't, don't have room for maybe a big nutrition facts table on a small package, but you sure would have room for those three, you know, one or two, that's simple. So I think some of the technical 
aren't necessarily valid, but um, I think there's it actually in a way it almost would get around some of the technical exemptions where you couldn't fit in the truth and facts table you actually could put the front of facts symbol on them but um and then and some practical exemptions it's the same thing um you know they say well people already know honey butter table salt or high sources of sodium why would you let the salt or the you know a symbol that's high in sodium but i would say with you look at some of the popular press out there there's a lot of things people think honey is better than you you know you're not going to get all the sugar if you eat honey you know, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. So maybe some of those exemptions, it would really help that consumer education. You're not making a healthier choice just by choosing honey to replace your sugar. Um, and so this is some data that we did. This is actually 2017 data. We've done the 2020 data, but um, we have a big uh, branded food label database. And it really, we look at all of the foods that are available in that grocery stores and or online. And we said, okay, so this is what our food supply looks like. And Health Canada is using this as their baseline data is how many foods would actually have to have a front of plant warning. So we'll know if we have any effect, we have to have a baseline. So this is the baseline data of what the food supply looked like in 2017. And so more than half, about 50 some percent of our 54% of the food supply that packaged foods that currently exist in Canada would have to have a, a front of pack symbol on. So most of them would have symbol for one nutrient, but about 20% would carry two high-end symbols, and only about 2% would have all three. Um, and then you can see there's 20%, 30% below the thresholds, that's great, and about 10% of some of these exempted foods are exempted. So that kind of gives you an idea, so at least we'll know now how many of these foods are going to be reformulated between now and 2026, so that's the 10-year industry know about it since 2016 so you know how many foods will be reformulated so hopefully so we'll we don't have to wait for the regulations because industry may be already starting in you know in the shorter term so we've got some good baseline data to see how ones and then is there any difference between nutrients it's pretty even about you know a third just under a third would have either sh total sugars some of them would have about 26 for sodium and about 22 percent for sat fats so just kind of it's a pretty even spread of the amount of, of high-end symbols that consumers would see for different nutrients. I'm just going to take a glass of water here. Excuse me. That's what we see in the, on the um, grocery shelf. Um, but this is one that Jen, Jennifer did in our lab, where she actually took our FLIP database and actually matched it with um, the CCHS database and said, well, okay, so now we look at the food supply. How many of those foods would that people actually eat? Because you could have a, a front of pack uh, symbol on a food that people really don't eat very often. It's not going to have much of an impact, but if it's foods they consume, wanted to know about it. So actually about, depending on the nutrient, about 16 to 40% of the foods uh, would show that people are actually eating now would, cons would have a front of pack symbol on it. And it varies by nutrients. So if you look at the different colors um, for energy, for example, um, one of the interesting one that isn't talked is all the foods we consume away from home won't have front of pack symbols on. And you, you and I well know that many of those foods you can go to either restaurants or fast foods or get takeout delivery could really be high in sodium, sugars, high fat. They're all exempted. So that's about 14% of the energy we're getting from those foods, from uh, basic foods that like restaurant away from home foods. About... 30%, 35% are exempted. So that's those exempted foods. Uh, about 27% uh, are below the threshold. So there's more exempted foods than, than the healthy foods below the um, threshold. And then about 25% are would have, um, and that's for energy. And then you can see that for the other um, nutrients, you can see how that distribution is. So with this issue, with this, like I was saying, that I gave the example of cheeses. Well, that's part of that, Those all those, foods that are contributed to saturated fats, most of the sources of saturated fat in our diet, which come from probably dairy products and meats, many of them will be exempted from the front of pack uh, labeling because they're like meats are served in packages without front of, uh, without any nutritional labels on them. Um, and things like many of the dairy products um, are exempted. So just to say for that, while the free sugars, there's much fewer uh, exemptions because most of the free sugars are actually added, the sugars are actually added to food, so they wouldn't have an exemption. So you can just sort of see how those play out by the way the system was developed or the policy was developed. So this is what the data, so right now we haven't got the policy in place, 
Um, but Nadi is another PhD student in my lab. And so we've been doing a lot of what we call health risk, health benefits, economic benefits. So what we did is we took the data from Chile and that systematic review I showed you and the WHO criteria, which are what the sort of the gold standard and said, if those were achieved in Canada, how many lives would we save by having that, um, you know, those regulations in Canada? And so if we got the same, if we get the same impact they had in Chile, Chile we'd save about 6,400 lives a year uh, due to uh, chronic diseases. And by the systematic review, obviously there were a bit more, but those were simulated environments. So they might be over-optimistic. Um, and about 12,000, if we actually had stringent enough targets as strong as what the WHO would recommend, we'd probably see even additional, almost twice the benefits. But at least it gives us an idea of how many diet-related NCDs we can prevent um, using the front of pack system by the evidence that we've seen in countries already. And, and I said, remember there's two pathways of where the benefits come from, either through product reformulation or through change of food and beverage purchases. So we've got the data both ways. And so what she's done is actually modeled the different scenarios, what proportion or what would be due to changes in purchasing and food substitution, which is often the um, substitution. In other words, the data in um, some of the countries originally early said that people would only choose about 30% of the food people would say, I'll choose a low and the other ones, I'll just keep eating mothers up to about the best case scenario. But 70% of people said, no, I'll avoid um, the front of pack symbols and choose a healthier food. So we modeled the ranges and you can see that the, depending on how much that substitute, you make that substitution, you will have obviously greater if you reduce your intake of the foods with front of pack systems and substitute with the food without a front of pack, you will obviously see greater benefits. But the substitution, that was that early study I showed from Shelly, you don't get a full reduction because you're not getting rid of all that sugar or all that sodium. You're still choosing some sodium and some sugar from a lower sodium or lower sugar option, but you're still getting huge benefits um, in terms of lives saved in the country. And I think this type of modeling is really good, maybe not so much in Canada because we've gone that road, for other countries to understand what the benefits are that they could have. And that really speaks to policymakers, to government regulators. Why is it worthwhile doing this? Because they know how much it costs in their healthcare systems um, and the debt and disability in the country. So that's the science, that's the policy. I'm gonna spend the last little part of my presentation just talking about the politics because policies happen not in a vacuum, they happen in the real world. And so I just have a few more slides talking about some of the politics we saw around front of pack labeling. And I think one of the things that we were really fortunate is when Health Can introduced the healthy eating strategy, they actually committed to uh, an out of the, they had a correspondence and um, all the meetings and correspondence database. And it really was, and I'll show it, and I just sort of said it opened the door on lobbying and influencing because I knew what used to happen because I'd worked in government, but nobody in the outside world knew how many people were coming in and out of our offices asking for a meeting, lobbying on, you know, a certain policy that was happening. And so they provided this website and it was called the Transparency. And so basically every meeting that, and it wasn't just industry, but anyone, heart and stroke came in, industry came in, anytime they had a meeting on any of the healthy eating policies and they're listed there, it was recorded. All the correspondence, so the letter that you requested the meeting, the documents you sent in, if Health Canada brought documents to the meeting, everything was public. And so we went and we analyzed the data. I mean, you know, we're a researcher, you know, new database to analyze. So we analyzed that data and said, what what happened? So, Ella, uh, so this is what, what you would actually see. You see a record number, what the topic was, what organization met, what type of meeting, who initiated the meeting, you know, because government also organized meetings for stakeholders to update them, who organized what the purpose was, um, who we met with. We also did on marking the kids, Christine did a different one. I won't present the data type and said not only this, but at what level were those officials they met with? When we did marketing to kids, we found that the industry met with higher rank people more often, more broadly. So the health people, they never got above a director general. The industry met with deputy ministers, ministers, the prime minister's office, the health people never got in there. So not only does it, how many meetings you have, it's who you meet with is also influential. And then all the, the last column is all the documents associated with. We didn't do that on this 
data analysis in this study I'm presenting on um, front of pack labeling, but you can sort of see this. We did look at how many people came in. So um, there were 173 documents, we call it like records on, on the, um, in that open sea and transparency database, 62% of the meetings were with industry. 37% um, were non-industry, which is usually the NGOs. 28% were mixed. And those are usually ones that government organized. So they had, you know, a consultation, open webinar and things. And so lots of people, the mixed ones are usually government organized to a total of 173 meetings that were in that um, meetings and correspondence in the database. When we analyzed them, we said, we found out there were eight main topics that came up and then we grouped them into about three main key themes. So there's, you know, I mean, that's like what you do with focus testing. You actually analyze the topics that are raised and then what themes are happening. So when we actually looked at the, the topics that were raised. There were things like, you know, industry has to be engaged in policy development, you know, it affects us. They had real concerns about the policy. Um, they said, oh, they said consumers would respond one way to the other. Like they had their own opinions of how consumers, while well, I was at some meetings, said, well, we know consumers the best. We know how they will respond. They considered the evidence is weak. So we shouldn't, government shouldn't go forward with the policy. Um, they made lots of comparisons with what was in the U.S. So they said we shouldn't do that because we'd be out of step with the U.S. Canada shouldn't go down that road. They all talked about all kinds of practicalities. You know, how could they do it? Wouldn't work, blah, blah, blah. Um, they had real problems with the symbol. Like originally one of the uh, discussions was the stop sign. Like absolutely that was, you know, almost went go ballistic on the idea of having a stop sign on foods that was, you know, warning. We don't want warnings. They, all kinds of things we have warnings on. We don't want warnings on food. Foods are supposed to be healthy. And they actually saw themselves as a lead stakeholder in this. They must know more than anyone else on the thing. And so it really, when we put all the, the comments together, we really saw that they came up with sort of what I would call three main themes is the industry really wanted to control the agenda. Like they were the ones they promoted themselves as knowing the most about the policy. They should be the main ones consulted and it should be their concerns to have the most, um, you know, the most reflection and take their concerns the most in developing the policy. But not only did they do that, they also questioned the policy in the beginning with like, do we even need the policy? Was there even scientific uh, evidence for it? Is it, you know, even rational? for even having the policy. So they really, in the end of that thematic, they really dismissed it as a policy that the candidate didn't need, wouldn't be beneficial. And it really, you know, questioned the whole sort of dismissal of the policy. Like, you know, we shouldn't even be here discussing it. There isn't enough evidence for that policy. So you can see that there was, and the, don't forget, they were meeting with higher level officials more often. So if you were, if you were a decision maker, what messages are you hearing most often and by who? You can see that all of a sudden, the messages that the highest levels of decision making are hearing most often are through this lens. This is the information they're hearing. And so I think, that I say open the door, but I think that's a big, big door open that we never had before without, because nobody in the outside world ever knew what went on in these meetings. So I think this is a really first step. So I, that was a great step, allowed us to do some analysis and publish. I forgot to put that, but that I can send the references that it's all been published. But then we also, interestingly, Globe and Mail put a study up and I called the backdoor efforts. And so once people started realizing these were all open and transparent, um, what we also saw was evidence, and that was uh, published in the Globe and Mail, is that there was secret memos revealed that what happens is if they didn't want to be recorded on the open and transparency website, food industry would go to agriculture and then agriculture would talk to Health Canada and that wasn't subject to the open and transparency because government talking to government isn't part of the open and transparency data. So you can see that even once they realized what was happening, industry found other ways to try to circumvent, go through the back door to get their messages heard and not have it recorded. So maybe there were many others that aren't accounted for for that 65% of the meetings because they were also doubling it up. And when we looked at um, marketing the kids, not only did they go to agriculture, they went to treasury board, to industry, to all the economic portfolios, social services, um, and human development, you name it, they went everywhere. So you can imagine the multiplier effect you get when you get that message, just not only to one department, but to multiple departments. So I would call that the sort of the backdoor efforts that went on in these things that are outside of the open and transparency, because none of the other departments were reporting on those meetings.
And then not only was the politics local, it actually became international. And I think this is an interesting one where it actually came up during the NAFTA negotiations that US actually lobbied hard that um, basically that um, any kind of front of pack warning system, junk food type ones, should be off the table and actually be outlawed under an after agreement. And of course, Mexico was going down the same road too. So you had Mexico and Canada. Um, and so, and I thought, and so, you know, there's an article from the Golden, Golden Mail, an article from the New York Times, but it was all over, you know, I could have picked press clippings for almost any year, uh, clips from the things. But I thought the other one is interesting. Not only did factually that you see the New York Times and go the mail, you also saw these other editorials like how now will make a spat that the US has their way. So that's a uh, you know consumer friendly or you know a different take on the same um, message that you saw in the uh, you know sort of I say the traditional mainstream media. But it just says that this is how this politics wasn't just confined to Canada. We actually saw and I was at many meetings where not only did the people and the Health Canada had several meetings where they invited public with health experts, as well as, you know, industry stakeholders to weigh in on this topic. But it wasn't just the Canadian representatives, like the food industry set their representatives from like, like, you know, their headquarters offices, be it mostly in the US or in Europe. So they were really, really working hard against front of pack labeling, but not just the Canadian, it was like their headquarters also really working on it. So I just sort of say that what happens in one country doesn't just get, the lobbying efforts don't just occur from that one country, you'll also see lobbying happening from outside the country to try and influence the policies in Canada. So this is my last slide. Um, I've talked a lot and probably can't talk much more, but anyways, um, I just wanted to kind of say that, you know, when you think of policy development, you know, it might be nice and simple to think of as nice, clear, linear line, but actually it's not the way it happens. You know, it really is what I would call this sort of cycle. And sometimes it does ifs and backs and forths and, and you know, and it really depends on the political climate. You have change of governments, and you know, many of these policies totally stop dead. You know, well, they all they always by law have to stop when there's an election called. But during that whole getting ready for elections, a lot of policies will stop. That the political climate says, you know, which party will support certain policies, which ones don't. A lot of things to happen. Um, the economics of it. I mean, you know, we're coming out of a, like a big inflationary period. A lot of food policies, if they affect food pricing, so our latest CHR grant is to look at the effects of food policies on food pricing. I mean, if we're going to be having these policies and we actually you know, indirectly increase the price of foods to consumers, you can see that, that that would be a big concern. So, you know, economics, global initiatives, like we could have recommendations from the World Health but all the you know trade agreements, the other you know sort of countries don't live in a vacuum, and if they have really important trading partners, they may sacrifice certain policies to keep their trading partners happy. And I think that's what the U.S. was hoping at that time. And of course, the media plays a role, and I just use some of those examples. But having those things on the front page just really brought attention to these policies, and you know, uh, and then you know, obviously the consumers, the science, industry, and government are all interacting to really help develop these policies, but it's not just, a, it's a really interaction. I could have drawn the arrows every way and I could have drawn hiccups and I have a front of pack labeling, excuse me, a marketing the kids one with an RIP at the end because that's where we're at right now. I mean, we hopefully it's resurrected, but at one point it died, you know, so sometimes policies never make it up to the end and sometimes they do. So with that, I want to thank you all very much. Oh, and I wanted to put this slide up. Um, I actually talked a lot and I didn't give credit all the way through because I couldn't have, but this is some slides, just of pictures over the years. There've been huge numbers of people that work for my lab and the kudos belong to them. They're actually the ones that did all the work and I just sort of come up with ideas of more work for them to do and most of them. And also the funding agencies, uh, CITR has been great to us over the years, but um, Heart and Stroke, Girls Welcome, IDRC, um, a lot of this work we've done in Canada, but they fund a lot of our work in helping developing countries do this work in some of the Latin American countries. Um, Lawson Center funded some of our um, children's work and the, through the WHO and our collaborating center are another funder for a lot of our work. So with that, thank you all very much and hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Mary. We've got lots of time for questions and we're going to open up the room for a little reception, I believe, afterwards. We've got lots of time. Any questions for Mary? Uh, I have a comment first. And an anecdote, and that I have a question um, about the transparency 
when it was applied that it was clear that we were going to have to have this transcript because I was still in the director at that time. Um, the, my colleagues were really happy about that. And the reason being, the industry is always asking for meetings on lots of things. And when, when that policy was implemented, the requests for meetings by industry went down a lot because they didn't want to have it reported that they were doing. Obviously, they found other ways to try to influence it. But my colleagues in the food director were really happy because um, every time you have a meeting with the industry, it's also it's um, stressful from a bureaucratic point of view. And so that's just an anecdote that it is interesting. I can that's second that because when I was a director, and if you spend your whole life walking back and forth to a meeting with the industry, you're never getting any work done. You know? yeah. I mean, yeah, it exactly. just and the prep work and all those preparing your presentations and the research responding yeah. to comments takes huge amounts of time. Yeah. Exactly. Now my other my other comment was around, around the front of tax labeling because you've got kind of the positive promoting stars uh front of tax type labeling. And that you know you get reformulation of food to increase stars. So it's like increasing the health of the food. The negative kind of health front of pack labeling, like the, the warning signs, like what we now have, you get reformulation, but sometimes it's reformulation behind the scenes. So for instance, in Chile, you got a reduction of sugars in those, because it was always sugars, the sugar sweet beverages and things like that. But then they reformulate by adding non-nutritive sweeteners, and it could be argued that that has um, health impacts. And so the reformulation to get away from the negative warning type front of pack doesn't always end up with the more helpful food. So just your comment on that. Yeah, I mean, we're getting net benefits, but I think we don't, we're not getting as much benefits as what we'd hope. And, and I'll just, you, you use British figure and I'll use that as an example. We did analysis of our flip, our large database of the lower sugar options. And, you know, if you've got uh, lower sugar options and if, you know, the sugar goes down by, you know, say 15% in these groups of, you know, their lower sugar cereals or things like, I mean, public foods, not beverages. Um, so there's two issues. With foods, you get these lower sugar options. But in actual facts, most of them just have like high dextrose added and all that. The calories, so you might get 15, 20% reduction in sugars, but you only get a couple of percentage. And so we, so we're for 15 or 20% reduction in sugars, might only get a 4% reduction in calories. So, and most of the, uh, other than for dental health, most of the metabolic, adverse effects to sugars are mediated through calories. So for the amount of sugar you get down, you're not getting the equivalent amount of a reduction in calories in solid foods because as the sugar goes in, some other solid goes in, it's usually some kind of multidextran starches, refined starches, which are from a metabolic point of view. I'm looking at John right here, he can tell me, metabolically you'll raise insulin, you'll do all the things that sugar does. For beverages, that's a different story. I mean, and most of the sources of sugars of free sugars are coming from like a beverage, not all of them, but a lot of them are. And in that case, you are getting that most of that replacing by the you know non-nutritive sweeteners. And so that is um, a concern for many. And many of the um, nutrient profiling systems that we're using, like for the follow recommendation, also want wants to flag the addition of, of non-nutritive sweeteners. So Many governments in Mexico are doing that too. So they're building their profiling system to and they actually removed a lot of the what I would call front of pack labeling that used to tell that was originally based on this aspartame, that it was on the I think it was also yeah, it was on the front of pack. And they said, well, there's many others, so we'll take it off. The others aren't. So actually, in fact, we have less transparency about the non neutral sweeteners that used to be for some of them on the front, now none of them are. So it's just in the ingredient list. So a lot of people think that's wrong, and if many groups have advocated that they shouldn't be using as much artificial sweeteners, that we looked at it, they're still quite well. They're getting higher, but they're not near threshold. But I mean, that could change with more food change. So yeah, it's something that absolutely should be more monitored. And I think the even the WHO recommendations were pretty lukewarm, like not really recommending it to be, you know, a great substitute. And at least one should be washed. So yeah, and, and those ADIs were based on the amount that was typically consumed and then factors both that consumption levels go way up 
than the amount of room between our actual intakes and the ADI, you know, acceptable daily intake thresholds could get smaller and smaller. So, I mean, obviously you should watch it and some of the governments are actually putting limits on that or you can't like, you know, if they have the front of pack system, they said you can't use the front of pack system, you can't use those in school and their front of pack system also has artificial sweeteners, so you're keeping them out of children. So governments are using, some of them are using it, but not many right now. Yes. Yeah, um, I just had a question, you know, obviously front of pack labels have come in for packaged foods. Um, now in Canada, there's an awful lot of, um, <laughs> it's, it's some areas, there's an awful lot of alcohol consumption and alcohol never really seems to be lumped in when it comes to this kind of labeling type of initiative. And there's reasons for that. Do you ever foresee any kind of appetite for making it more transparent how many calories come from a consumption of uh, you know can of beer um yeah a uh, glass of wine and, uh, and making that more visible on the label you know i think i have mixed feelings i'll put it, put it honestly i mean right now alcoholic beverages are not subject they're not considered right. food it's not subject to nutritional labeling some countries they are um and i know I was thinking Codex has that as part of it. It's kind of not really going very far. That's the international standard setting bodies for, for food safety and food training and nutrition. And they were dealing with alcohol labeling. But I would actually say, if I were really going to push for alcohol labeling, I think it would be more important to have the warnings on alcohol. For example, like what they tried, like um, Aaron Holden tried with the study in Yukon, where they actually said about, you know, the risk for or cancer, or birth defects. I mean, I think probably the evidence is better and maybe if you're gonna fight one of the battles with the alcohol industry, it may be a better, it might be the bigger public health problem of the adverse effects of alcohol rather than the calories. But I mean, I can admit to you, there's not, it's definitely not an insignificant amount of calories that are definitely there. But I guess if you really wanted to fight for labeling on alcoholic beverages, you know, do you want to go down the road and say more like tobacco? Because it's not an essential thing like tobacco where you have, you know, restrictions on sales. We've already got restrictions on sales. We want to put more progressive warning labels on alcohol beverage. That might be the bigger public health bang for your efforts, but I'm not an alcohol expert, so I'm just kind of, I don't say guessing, but I'm just sort of using my, what I've read, you know, kind of feeling. But a fair question. I mean, I always wondered, especially as you saw more and more of those, um, you know, all the, I won't name brand names, but you know, those mixed beverages where they're the alcohol and things, you know, I mean, they're just becoming so popular, but there's only a lot of calories in some of those ones that they're with the sweetened, you know, beverage mixed cocktails kind of things. There's some huge calories in some of those beverage products. Thanks. Thanks very much for this. Um, as Alula, will director at uh, in Canada. I know I understand oh, why, why I don't get uh, requests from industry for meetings. <laughs> but um, you, but uh, I was very much involved in the PAHO nutrient profile um, guidelines. Yeah, and so right. all of this is really, really um, interesting and you know relevant to um, the food formulation to healthy, healthy, healthy uh, promoting healthy lifestyles and healthy food environments. Um, so in implementing the product pack labeling, there is a requirement, there will be a requirement to reformulate. And in this, in the environment now where there's a concern around food prices and the the cost of reformulating, do you do you think that we would actually get a reasonable reduction in the nutrients of concern when these foods are reformulated? Well, interesting. I, I gave another presentation this morning with USDA midday today. So I was at double duty today. One of the slides I showed, I was going to look at, which was on my own computer, well, I pulled it up. I don't, this isn't my computer. We actually looked at a flip between so, uh, 2013 and 2017. That was a four year period. And we mapped all the matching UPC posts. There was no regulatory changes that happened in Canada during that period. We mapped all the foods in flip between 2015 and 20, uh, 2013 and 2017, four year period. 
And so we, you know, we, we have UPC codes for everything. So we say, okay, so about 40% of the products were just discontinued. They just disappeared. Like they were on the market in 2013. They're not there in 2017. About 60% of the ones are just new products. Like they weren't there when we looked four years ago. And then the ones that have like the six, the sort of half of the products that were still there, because half of the products are still there in both years. Of that half that are still there, about another half of those are reformulated, like they had different calorie levels. So we looked at calories. So obviously the industry has already done something to change it. There was no regulations. There was nothing they had to do, but their calories had changed. And then of the ones that still were the same, like Patricia Back's table hadn't changed, we looked at the the front, like the front principal display panel, the front of the package. And most of those had changed. So really when we added it all together, 89% of the foods, packaged foods in Canada had already changed their food packaging, irrespective of, like they voluntarily changed it with nothing to do with regulations. So I would say that that, if you, like in Canada's given companies four years to do these front of pack label changes, so I would say the food industry is already just normal turn of events on their own volition are changing 90% of the food packages in a four year package, whether they're gonna do an Olympic, you know, special, they're gonna feature new, the latest cartoon characters from the latest movies, or they do some reformulation because one ingredient becomes less expensive than others. They voluntarily have done that to 90% of our food supply over a four year period. So I think a lot of these, the reformulation will cost them money, but that whole cost of relabeling, I think is a oversell to impede sort of some of those labeling regulatory changes. So yes, I will give you granted, reformulation can cost money, particularly if they do it well. We wanna get, you know, these healthy reformulation changes. Yeah, that can definitely cost money. Um, but I would say when we saw those nutrition facts tables, there, there's a certain amount of continuous change in reformulation because certain ingredients become, markets change over four years, certain ingredients become more or less expensive, especially the big ones, like the main fats, the carbohydrates, those change, and those are the big bulk of what foods cost. So, and I also read some numbers, their marketing budgets are bigger than their, their formulation budgets by a long stretch. So, you know, put it in perspective of what, where the money gets spent in. Um, marketing costs a lot more than um, from the what that spends on their reformulation costs. I so I heard. I haven't seen the actual numbers, but I've heard that. Any other comments? Well, that probably brings us to the end of the formal events. Thank you very much, Mary. Really good presentation. And so we, you know, we look forward to hearing your feedback on what you like today and what you think we can improve on. Uh, let us know. Uh, thank you once again, Mary. Thank you, Amanda, for coming uh, to give this excellent talk. And I, you know, open it up now for a more casual reception. Enjoy.